Welcome everybody to uh, lesson five. Um, and so we have uh, officially peaked and everything is downhill from here uh, as of halfway through the last lesson. Um, we started with computer vision because um, it's the most mature, kind of out of the box, ready to use deep learning application. It's something which, if you're not using deep learning, you won't be getting good results. So the difference, you know, hopefully between not doing lesson one versus doing lesson one, you've gained a new capability you didn't have before. Um, and you kind of get to see a lot of the um, kind of trade craft of training an effective neural net. And so then we moved into NLP um, because uh, text is kind of another one which you really kind of can't do really well without deep learning, um, generally speaking. And uh, it's just got to the point where it's pretty, um, you know, works pretty well now. In fact, the New York Times just uh, featured an article about the latest advances in deep learning for text yesterday and uh, talked quite a lot about the work that we've done in that area along with uh, uh, OpenAI and uh, Google and the Allen Institute of uh, Artificial Intelligence. Um, and then we've um, kind of finished our application journey with tabular and collaborative filtering, um, partly because tabular and collaborative filtering are things that you can still do pretty well um, without deep learning, so it's not such a big step. Um, it's not a kind of whole new thing that you could do that you couldn't used to do. And also because um, the you know, we're going to try to get to a point where we understand pretty much every line of code and the implementations of these things, and the implementations of, of those things is much less intricate than uh, vision and NLP. Uh, so as we come down this uh, other side of the journey, which is like all the stuff we've just done, how does it actually work? Um, by, by starting where we just ended, which is starting with collaborative filtering and then uh, tabular data, we're going to be able to see what all those lines of code do um, by the end of today's lesson. That's our goal. So, particularly this lesson, you should not expect to come away knowing how to solve, you know, how to do applications you couldn't do before, but instead you should have a better understanding of, of what, how we've actually been solving the applications we've seen so far. Um, particularly, we're going to understand a lot more about regularization, which is how we go about managing over versus underfitting. And so hopefully you can use some of the tools from this lesson to go back to your previous projects and get a little bit more performance or handle models where previously maybe you felt like your data was not enough uh, or maybe you were underfitting um, and so forth. And it's also going to lay the groundwork for understanding convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks that we'll do deep dives into in the next two lessons. And as we do that, we're also going to look at some new applications, some new vision and NLP applications. Um, let's start where we left off um, last week. Uh, do you remember uh, this picture. Um, so this picture, we were looking at kind of what does a deep neural net look like? And we had um, various layers. And the first thing we pointed out is that there are um, only and exactly uh, two types of layer. There are layers that contain parameters and there are layers that contain activations. Uh, parameters are the things that your model learns. They're the things that you use gradient descent to go parameters minus equals learning rate times parameters dot grad. Right? That's our basic, that's what we do. Okay? And um, those parameters are used by multiplying them by input activations doing a matrix product. So the yellow things are our weight matrices, or weight tensors more generally, but that's close enough. 
So we take some input activations or some layer activations and we multiply it by a, a weight matrix to get a bunch of activations. So activations are numbers, but these are numbers that are calculated. Okay, so um, I find in our study group, I keep getting questions about where does that number come from? And I always answer it in the same way. You tell me, is it a parameter or is it an activation? Because it's one of those two things. Okay, that's where numbers come from. I guess inputs are kind of a special activation. So they're not calculated, they're just there. So maybe that's a special case. So maybe it's an input or a parameter or an activation. Um, Activations don't only come out of matrix multiplications, they also come out of activation functions. And the most important thing to remember about an activation function is that it's an element-wise function. So it's a function that is applied to each element of the input activations in turn and creates one activation for each input element. So if it starts with a 20 long vector, it creates a 20 long vector by looking at each one of those in turn, doing one thing to it and spitting out the answer. Okay, so an element-wise function. Um, ReLU is the main one we've looked at. And honestly, it doesn't too much matter which you pick. So we don't spend much time talking about activation functions because if you just use ReLU, you'll get a pretty good answer pretty much all the time. Um, and so then we learned that this combination of matrix multiplications followed by ReLUs stacked together has this amazing mathematical property called the Universal Approximation Theorem, which is if you have big enough weight matrices and enough of them, it can solve uh, any arbitrarily complex mathematical function to any arbitrarily high level of accuracy. Assuming that, you can train the parameters, both in terms of uh, time and data availability and so forth, okay? So that's the bit which I find particularly more advanced computer scientists get really confused about is they're always asking like, where's the next bit? What's the trick? How does it work? But th that's it. You know, you just do those things and you pass back the gradients and you update the weights with the learning rate and that's it. So that piece where we um, take the, um, the loss function between the uh, actual um, targets and the output of the final layer, so the final activations, we calculate the gradients with respect to all of these yellow things, and then we update those yellow things by learning rate, by subtracting learning rate times the gradient. Um, that process of calculating those gradients and then subtracting like that is called back propagation. Okay, so when you hear the term, uh, well, that's a very small font. So when you see, when you hear the term back propagation, it's one of these terms that neural networking folks love to use. It sounds very impressive, okay, but you can replace it with your head with um, uh, weights minus equals weights dot grad times learning rate, or parameters, I should say, rather than weights, a bit more general. Okay, so, um, that's what we covered last week. And then I mentioned last week that we're going to cover a couple more things. Um, I'm gonna come back to these ones, cross entropy and softmax later today. Um, let's talk about fine tuning now. So what happens when we take a ResNet 34 and we do transfer learning? What's actually going on? So the first thing to notice is the ResNet 34 that, that we grab from ImageNet, um, has a very specific weight matrix at the end. It's a weight matrix that has 1,000 columns. Why is that? Because ImageNet, the problem they ask you to solve in the ImageNet competition, is please uh, figure out which one of these 1,000 image categories this picture is. So that's why they need 1,000 things here, because in ImageNet, this target vector is length 1,000. It's, uh, you've got to pick the probability that it's which one of those thousand things. Um, so there's a couple of reasons this weight matrix is no good to you when you're doing transfer learning. The first is that um, you probably don't have a thousand categories. You know, I was trying to do teddy bears, black bears, or brown bears, so I don't want a thousand categories. And the second is even if I did have exactly a thousand categories, they're not the same thousand categories that are in ImageNet. 
So basically, this whole weight matrix is a waste of time for me. So what do we do? We throw it away. So when you go create CNN in FastAI, it deletes that. And what does it do instead? Instead, it puts in two new weight matrices in there for you. With a ReLU in between. And so um, there are some defaults as to what size this first one is. Um, but the second one, the size there is as big as you need it to be. So in your data bunch, which you pass to your learner, uh, from that we know uh, how many activations you need. If you're doing classification, it's however many classes you have. If you're doing regression, it's however many numbers you're trying to predict in the regression problem. And so remember that in your, if your data bunch is called data, that'll be called data.c. So we'll add for you this weight matrix of size data.c by however much was in the previous layer. Um, OK, so now we need to train those, because um, initially, these weight matrices are full of random numbers. OK, because new weight matrices uh, are always full of random numbers if they're new, and these ones are new. We've just we've grabbed them and thrown them in there. Um, so we need to train them. Um, but the other layers are not new. The other layers are good at something, right? And what are they good at? Well, let's remember that um, Zeiler and Fergus paper. Um, here are examples of some uh, visualization of some filters, some, some weight matrices in the first layer, and some examples of some things that they found. Right? So the first layer had um, one uh, part of the weight matrix was good at finding diagonal edges in this direction. And then in layer two, one of the filters was good at finding corners in the top left. And then in layer three, one of the filters was good at finding uh, repeating patterns. Uh, another one was good at finding round orange things. Another one was good at finding kind of like fairy or floral textures. So as we go up, they're becoming more sophisticated, but also more specific. Right? So like layer four, I think, was finding like eyeballs, for instance. Now, if you're um, wanting to transfer and learn to uh, something for histopathology slides, there's probably going to be no eyeballs in that. Right? So the later layers are no good for you. But there'll certainly be some repeating patterns, and there'll certainly be some diagonal edges. Right? So the earlier you go in the model, the more likely it is that you want those weights to stay as they are. Um, well, to start with, we definitely need to train these new weights because they're random. So let's not bother training any of the other weights at all to start with. So what we do is we basically say, let's freeze. Let's freeze all of those other layers. So what does that mean? All it means is that we're asking FastAI and PyTorch that when we train um, you know, however many epochs we do, when we call fit, don't back propagate the weights, but don't back propagate the gradients back into those layers. In other words, when you go parameters equals parameters minus learning rate times gradient, only do it for the new layers, don't bother doing it for the other layers. That's what freezing means, okay? Just means don't update those parameters. So it'll be a little bit faster. Um, as well, because there's a few less calculations to do. Um, it'll take up a little bit less memory, because there's a few less gradients that we have to store. Um, but most importantly, it's not going to change weights that are already better than nothing. They're better than random, at the very least. So that's what happens when you call freeze. It doesn't freeze the whole thing. It freezes everything except the randomly generated added layers that we put on for you. So then what happens next? OK, after a while, we say, OK, this is looking pretty good. We probably should train the rest of the network now. So we unfreeze. Right? And so now we're going to train the whole thing. But we still have a pretty good sense that these new layers we added to the end probably need more training. And these ones right at the start that might just be like diagonal edges 
probably don't need much training at all. So we split our, um, our model into a few sections, right? And we say, let's give um, different parts of the model different learning rates. So this part of the model, we might give a learning rate of 1e neg 5. And this part of the model, we might give a learning rate of 1e neg 3, say. And so what's going to happen now is that we can keep training the entire network, but because the learning rate for the early layers is smaller, it's going to move them around less because we think they're already pretty good. And also, like, if it's already pretty good to the optimal value, if you used a higher learning rate, it could kick it out, right? It could actually make it worse, which we really don't want to happen. Okay? So this, uh, this process is called using discriminative learning rates. You won't find much online about it, because I think we were kind of the first to use it for this purpose, or at least talk about it extensively. Maybe other, probably other people used it without writing it down. So most of the stuff you'll find about this will be fast AI students. Um, but it's, it's starting to get more well known slowly now. Um, but it's a really, really important concept. For transfer learning without using this, you just can't get nearly as good results. So how do we do discriminative learning rates in fast AI? Um, when you, um, when you uh, anywhere you can put a learning rate, in fast AI, such as with the fit function. Now, the first thing you put in is the number of epochs, and then the second thing you put in is learning rate. Same if you use fit one cycle. The learning rate, you can put a number of things there. You can put a single number, like 1e e neg 3. You can write a slice. So you can write slice, for example, 1e e neg 3, with a single number. Or you can write slice with two numbers. What do each of those mean? Uh, in the first case, just using a single number means every layer gets the same learning rate. So you're not using discriminative learning rates. If you pass a single number to slice, it means the final layers get a learning rate of whatever you wrote down, of whatever you wrote down, 1e, neg 3. Um, and then all the other layers get the same learning rate, which is that divided by 3. Okay, So all of the other layers will be 1e e neg 3 divided by 3. And the last layers will be 1e e neg 3. And in the last case, the final layers, the, these randomly added layers, will still be again 1e e neg 3. The first layers will get 1e e neg 5. And the other layers will get learning rates that are equally spread between those two so uh, multiplicatively equal, right? So if there were three layers, there would be 1e neg 5, 1e neg 4, 1e neg 3. So equal multiples each time. Um, uh, one slight tweak. Um, to make things a little bit simpler to manage, we don't actually give a different learning rate to every layer. We give a different learning rate to every layer group, which is just we decide to put the groups together for you. And so specifically what we do is the randomly added extra layers, we call those one layer group. This is by default, you can modify it. And then all the rest, we split in half into two layer groups. So by default, at least with a CNN, you'll get three layer groups. And so if you say slice 1 in neg 5, 1 in neg 3, you will get 1 in neg 5 learning rate for the first layer group, 1 in neg 4 for the second, 1 in neg 3 for the third. So now if you go back and look at the way that we're training, hopefully you'll see that this makes a lot of sense. Um, this divided by three thing um, is a little weird, and we won't talk about why that is until part two of the course. Um, it's a specific quirk around batch normalization. Um, so we can discuss that in the advanced topic if anybody's interested. Uh, all right, so that is... Um, that is fine tuning. Uh, so hopefully that um, makes that a little bit less mysterious. So um, we were looking at 
collaborative filtering last week. And um, uh, in the collaborative filtering example, we called fit one cycle and we passed in just a single number. And that makes sense because in collaborative filtering, we only have um, one layer. There's a few different pieces in it, but there isn't you know, a, 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 um, a matrix multiply followed by an activation function followed by another matrix multiply. Uh, I'm going to introduce a, another piece of jargon here. Um, they're not always exactly matrix multiplications. Um, they're something very similar. They're, they're linear functions that we add together. Um, but the more general term for these, for these things that are a bit more general than matrix multiplications is affine functions. Okay, so if you hear me say the word affine function, you can replace it in your head with matrix multiplication. But as we'll see when we do convolutions, convolutions are matrix multiplications where some of the weights are tied. And so it would be slightly more accurate to call them affine functions. And I like to introduce a little bit more jargon each lesson so that when you, you know, read books or papers or watch other courses or read documentation, there will be more of the words you'll recognize. Okay? So when you say affine function, it just means a linear function. Right? And it, it means something very, very close to matrix multiplication. A matrix multiplication is the most common kind of affine function, uh, at least in deep learning. Um, so, uh, specifically for collaborative filtering, uh, the model we were using was this one. It was where we had a bunch of numbers here and a bunch of numbers here, and we took the dot product of them. And given that one here is a row and one is a column, we can actually, that's the same as a matrix product. So M mult in Excel multiplies matrices, so here is the matrix product of those two. Um, and so I started this um, training last week by using Solver in Excel, um, and we never actually went back to see how it went, so let, let's go and have a look now. Um, so the average sum of squared error got down to 0.39. So we're trying to predict something on a scale of 0.5 to 5. Uh, so on average, we're being wrong by about 0.4. That's pretty good. And you can kind of see it's pretty good um, if you look at like 3.51 is what it meant to be, 3.25, 5.1, 0.98. That's pretty close, right? Um, so you get the general idea. Um, and then I started to talk about this idea of embedding matrices. And so in order to understand that, let's put this uh, worksheet aside. I look at another worksheet. So here's another worksheet. And what I've done here is I have copied over those two weight matrices from the previous worksheet. Right? Here's the one for users, and here's the one for movies. And the movies one, I've transposed it, so it's now got exactly the same dimensions as the users one, okay? So the, here are two weight matrices. Initially, they were random. We can train them with gradient descent. Um, in the original data, the user IDs and movie IDs were numbers like these, okay? Um, to make life more convenient, I've converted them to numbers from 1 to 15, okay? So in these columns, I've got, for every rating, I've got user ID, movie ID, rating, using these mapped numbers so that they're contiguous starting at 1, okay? Now I'm going to replace user ID number 1 with this vector. The vector contains a 1 followed by 14 zeros. And then user number two, I'm going to replace with a vector of zero, and then one, and then 13 zeros, and so forth. So movie ID 14, all these are movie ID 14, I've also replaced with another vector, which is 13 zeros, and then a one, and then a zero. Okay. So uh, these are called um, one-hot encodings, by the way. Um, so this is not part of a neural net. This is just like some input pre-processing where I'm literally making this my new inputs. So this is my new inputs for my movies. This is my new inputs for my users, 
Okay, so these, these are the inputs to a neural net. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this um, input matrix and I'm going to do a matrix multiply by this um, weight matrix. And that'll work because this has 15 rows and this has 15 columns. So I can multiply those two matrices together because they match. And you can do matrix multiplication in Excel using the mmult function. Um, just be careful if you're using Excel, um, because this is a function that returns multiple numbers, um, you can't just hit enter when you finish with it, you have to hit control shift enter. Control shift enter means this is a array function, it's something that returns multiple values. So here is the matrix product of this input matrix of, per, of, um, of inputs and um, uh, this this uh, parameter matrix or weight matrix. Um, so that's just a normal neural network layer. Okay, it's just a, a, a regular matrix multiply. And so we can do the same thing for movies. And so here's the matrix multiply for movies. Well, here's the thing. Um, This input is, we claim, is this kind of one hot encoded version of user ID number one. And these activations are the activations for user ID number one. Why is that? Because if you think about it, a matrix multiplication between a one hot encoded vector and some matrix is actually going to find the nth row of that matrix when the one is in position n. Does that make sense? So what we've done here is we've actually got a, a matrix multiply that is creating this, these output activations, right? But it's doing it in a very interesting way, which is it's effectively finding a particular row in the input matrix. So having done that, we can then multiply those two sets together, uh, just a dot product, and we can then find the loss squared, and then we can find the average loss, and lo and behold, that number, 0.39, is the same as this number, because they're doing the same thing. So this one was kind of finding this particular user's embedding vector, this one is just doing a matrix multiply, and therefore we know they are mathematically identical. So let's lay that out again. So here's our final version. This is the same weight matrices again, exactly the same, I've copied them over. And here's those user IDs and movie IDs again, right? But this time I've laid them out just in a normal kind of tabular form, just like you would expect to see in the input to your model. And this time, I've got exactly the same set of activations here that I had here. But in this case, I've calculated these activations using Excel's offset function, which is an array lookup, right? It says, find the first row of this. So this is doing it as an array lookup. So this version is identical to this version, but obviously it's much less memory intensive and much faster because I don't actually create the one hot encoded matrix and I don't actually do a matrix multiply because that matrix multiply is nearly all multiplying by zero, which is a total waste of time. So in other words, multiplying by a one hot encoded matrix is identical to doing an array lookup. Therefore, we should always do the array lookup version. And therefore, we have a specific way of doing, we have a specific way of saying, I want to do a matrix multiplication by a one hot encoded matrix without ever actually creating it. I'm just instead going to pass in a bunch of ints and pretend they're one hot encoded. And that is called an embedding. Right? So you might have heard this word embedding all over the place as if it's some magic advanced mathy thing. But embedding means look something up in an array. 
Okay? But it's interesting to note that looking something up in an array is mathematically identical to doing a matrix product by a one-hot encoded matrix, and therefore an embedding fits very nicely in our standard model of how neural networks work. So now, suddenly, it's as if we have another whole kind of layer. It's a kind of layer where we get to look things up in an array. But we actually didn't do anything special, right? We just added this computational shortcut, this thing called an embedding, which is simply a fast and memory efficient way of multiplying by a one-hot encoded matrix. Okay, so this is really important because when you hear people say embedding, you need to replace it in your head with an array lookup, which we know is mathematically identical to a matrix multiplied by a one-hot encoded matrix. Here's the thing, though. It has kind of interesting semantics, right? Because when you do multiply something by a one-hot encoded matrix, you get this nice feature where the rows of your weight matrix, the values only appear for row number one, for example, where you get user ID number one in your inputs, right? So in other words, you kind of end up with this weight matrix where certain rows of weights correspond to certain values of your input. And that's pretty interesting. It's particularly interesting here because going back to our kind of most convenient way to look at this, because the only way that we can calculate an output activation is by doing a dot product of these two input vectors, that means that um, they kind of have to correspond with each other, right? Like there has to be some way of saying if this number for a user is high and this number for a movie is high, then the user will like the movie. So the only way that can possibly make sense is if these numbers represent features of personal taste and corresponding features of movies. For example, the movie has John Travolta in it and uh, user ID likes John Travolta, then you'll like this movie. Okay? So, like, we're not actually deciding the rows mean anything. We're not doing anything to make the rows mean anything. But the only way that this gradient descent could possibly come up with a good answer is if it figures out what the aspects of movie taste are and the corresponding features of movies are. So those underlying kind of features that appear are called latent factors. 